Bismillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ghfir wa na'udhu billahi min shurur anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'amalina man yahdihillahu falamudillalah wa man yudlil falahadiyalah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasul amma ba'd ya ayuhal ladhina amanu attakullaha haqqa tukati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ما بعد fa inna khayra al-kalami kalam Allah ta'ala wa khayra al-huda huda Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharru al-umur muhdathatuha wa kull muhdathatin bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalala wa kull dalala tin fi nar wa ba'd alhamdulillah alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enabled us as brothers inshallah to gather once again in one of his houses from the many houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to make mention of his name and to extol his glory and likewise to learn concerning the affair of his deen and to bring ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of that knowledge and that our intention as we already know should be purely for the sake of Allah but as a reminder for myself and likewise yourselves that the purpose of gathering for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to bring oneself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of his remembrance bringing oneself closer to his reminder learning more about him subhanahu wa ta'ala and learning about the affairs of the religion and the deen and increasing oneself in that which Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent with i.e. the knowledge of the book of book of Allah the Quran and the knowledge of his sunnah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it should not be done merely for the sake of so that it may be said that so and so attends the circles so therefore he is a good brother or therefore she is a good sister or so on and so forth rather we should purify our intentions at the beginning and in the middle and at the end of our actions of worship and indeed seeking knowledge or at least gathering to hear the mention of the words of Allah and the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is indeed from the best actions of worship. So, so in today inshallah what we're going to look at just briefly is a short treatise which was written by Sheikh Saleh Fawzan which was a if you like, a subtle response and a rebuttal of some of the groups of innovation in our time. And any of the groups of innovation likewise. But particularly in our time, in regards to the likes of the group uh, Jamaat al-Tabliq and al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin. Those who the ulama of our time consider to be the greatest calamity upon the Muslims or the most deviant groups from amongst the groups in our time at present and of course the most damage in regards to the call of Islam in regards to the calling of Islam and the call towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these two groups have been responsible for many calamities because from them have come the likes or the many groups of Sufiya or many groups of the Sufiya protect and hide themselves within the likes of Jamaat al-Tabliq and from the likes of the Quran Muslimin have come many of the likes of the people who are referred to nowadays as the terrorists or those who have uh, an extremism in regards to the likes of jihad and fighting in the way of Allah in this true way. So before a person can begin in his call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he should first recognize his situation and the situation that is around him. He needs to know the condition of the people who he's going to call. He needs to be aware of that which he is calling to, that which has priority with the people that are around him, and that which has a priority in reality 
i.e. that which should be called to first and foremost. Many of the groups that we find today, that they focus and they uh, grab onto certain aspects of Islam. So you will find, for instance, the Sufiya. They claim that they have love for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, their love goes beyond bounds and it falls into extremities and goes beyond bounds and falls into extremes such that they reach a level of worshipping Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or deifying Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is beyond bounds. Likewise, you have a group who may, for instance, say that the issue with the Muslims or the problem with the Muslims today is that they have lost the Khilafah or they have lost the Islamic uh, State and so therefore we need to focus upon that first and that will bring about the, de the times of, or the glory days, if you like, and the times of good, and bring back the Islamic, uh, re uh, if you like, revival. And by way of establishing that, that is how the Muslims will move forward. Then you have another group who focus upon the affairs of jihad. Then you have another group who focus upon, upon the affairs of economics. Another group who will focus upon politics, and so on and so forth. Then you have the group who will focus upon the affairs about which the messengers are focused upon. At Tawheed, calling upon, uh, worshipping Allah and singling up, uh, out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Aqeedah, singling out the affairs of belief and rectifying the hearts and the souls. And indeed, this is the way of the Salaf. And this is the methodology of the Prophets. They, did, they were not individuals who first called to politics. They were not first in, uh, individuals who, who their, their primary call was the call of economics or the fighting in jihad, or sitting down and making the incorrect dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, they were people who came to rectify the hearts and the minds and the souls of the individuals first. Rectifying their souls such that they would be upon correct worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to their tawheed, in regards to their aqeedah. So, the shaykh, he makes this short treatise in order to clarify the methodology of the Salaf in regards to calling to Allah and indeed that is known as the manhaj of the Anbiya i.e. the methodology and the way of the call of the Prophets, all of them. So the Shaykh he begins by saying that calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed is the way of all the messengers and uh, or the, is the way of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and is the way of all of the messengers and their followers. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Kul hadhi sabili أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ As Allah SWT mentions, say to them, O Muhammad, this is my straight way. This is my way. I the way of Allah SWT. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I call to the way of Allah عَلَىٰ بَصِيرَةٍ Upon sure sightedness or upon clear knowledge. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Me and whomsoever follows me. So if a person wishes to be a true follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he wishes to call to the way of Allah, then know that he must be upon basira. He must be upon knowledge. He must be upon clear-sightedness. For calling without knowledge is jahl, is ignorance. And it is not permissible to call or is not correct that a, or is, is not befitting that a person enters into the field of da'wah, enters into the realms of calling the people whilst he has no tools, whilst he does not have the foundation of, the basic foundation of that which he is to call to. Me and those who follow me. So anyone who claims to be a true follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and wishes to call to the way of Allah, know that it should be based upon knowledge, first and foremost. وَسُبْحَانَ wa ma'ana مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ and glory be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I am not from those who are mushrikeen. I am not from those who ascribe partners to Allah. So uh, is it befitting or is it conceivable that one who does not have an understanding of the opposite of shirk, i.e. a tawheed, that he can be a true caller to the way of Allah? Is it possible that a person who has not yet established the foundations of the rububiyah of Allah, the ibadah of Allah, in regards to Allah's names and attributes, is it possible that individual, that that individual can be a true caller to Allah? Of course not. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a condition. Ala basira, Upon knowledge, upon clear-sightedness, upon surety, or upon certainty. So the person must be upon that 
before he enters it upon the call. So he says, indeed, calling to the way of Allah was the mission of all the messengers. And indeed, you should understand likewise that this is the greatest of all occupations. Many of us and many of our you know, families, they desire from us to be a doctor or to be a teacher or to be an engineer, or to be so on and so forth. But the greatest of all occupations was the occupation of the messengers, all of them. And that is to call to the way of Allah. It does not mean, however, that a person cannot be these other things. It doesn't negate that. Of course you can be a doctor. Of course you can be a, a, a student, a, a, a teacher, or this, or that, or engineer. But if a person is calling to the way of Allah, indeed this is from the best of all occupations, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَنْ أَحْسُنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمْنَ الصَّالِحًا And who is there that is better in speech than the one who calls to the way of Allah and he does righteous actions? I.e., there is no one better in speech, in speaking. That if a person wants to speak, then let him speak with the words of Allah. Let him speak with the words of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For there is no one better than that one in regards to the people of man, uh, the people or from amongst mankind. Those who call to the way of Allah, indeed this is the best and the most loftiest of all occupations. So, the, so he mentioned that this is the mission and this was the duty of all the messengers and their followers. In order to bring the people out of the darkness into the light. And to bring them from kufr, from disbelief, into iman. So imagine, if a person truly understood the reality of the hellfire. The reality of that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for those who disbelieve. And he knows about the severity of the hellfire. It's fire being 69 times or 69 times hotter than the worldly fire. And that the hellfire is a place of eternal torment and eternal, and, uh, and eternal damnation, i.e. that a person will be punished in there forever if he denies and rejects belief in Allah. If a person truly knows about this, then he will recognize the lofty station of the one who tries to prevent mankind from that. He will recognize the reality of the one who is trying to safeguard mankind from falling into that punishment. This is a true call of, and, and a high lofty call if you like. This is a true call and it has high status, great status. That a person calls away from darkness to light, from iman or from kufr to iman. And from the fire to the paradise, this call to or, the, or this call of uh, this call to Allah rests upon firm principles. And this is now when the Sheikh will now enter into some of the pillars or the basic foundations by which a person should have with himself, or the characteristics of the caller that he should have in order to go out there and call the people away from this hellfire, and away from this darkness, and away from this kufr into the light and into the paradise, and into Iman. So he says that if a person doesn't have these foundations, if he doesn't have these principles with him, then he will find that his call will be futile, and he will be frustrated, or his call will end up frustrated, and he will become, uh, if you like, fatigued with his call, because he has, not, uh, he has not established the firm basis upon which that call should be made. Uh, he, has not settled, uh, he has not laid down the foundations for his call. So you'll find the one, like we mentioned, the one who his main call and his main focus is about the Jews. Everything is about the Jews. The Jews have done this, and the Jews have done that, and the Jews have done this, and the Jews have done such and such. Whereas calling or making a person aware of the plots and plans of the Jews does not make them necessarily aware of the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just knowing about the evil of the Jews or the plots of the Jews and the plots of this one and the plots of the Christian and the plots of that one just knowing about this alone is not sufficient. A person needs to know about the rights of Allah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed upon his creation, and what the creation has by way of a right upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they don't fall into the uh, shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he mentions from the first principles that a person must have with himself is knowledge. As we mentioned, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, كُلْ هَذِي السَّبِيلِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا And this basira, this, this clear-sightedness, is sure certain knowledge. Sure certain knowledge. So a person, if he wishes to go out in the field of da'wah, 
in the field of calling the people, he must have a firm basis. He must have knowledge of what the call is about. It makes no sense that he is unaware of the, of the if you like, the pitfalls of shirk. And he's not aware of the affairs of asma wa sifat and ilhad or, or if you like, deviation in regards to the names and attributes of Allah. And he's not aware of the affairs of shirk and the opposite of that. Then this individual, he will be like, if you like, the warrior who goes out without any armor or any weaponry. He goes out into battle, if you like, naked and with no armor and with no sword and with no weaponry. How is it that he expects to defeat his opponents or his enemies if he does not tool himself up, if he does not facilitate himself with weaponry or with tools? And indeed, knowledge, knowledge for the believer is like the tool or the weaponry for the soldier. He must have these weapons with him. He must have his defense with him in order to go out and call to the affair of uh, calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he mentioned... This basira is knowledge. So the caller is certain to face those from amongst the scholars of misguidance, those who will attack him with doubts and futile arguments in order to rebut the truth. So, as we know, when we go out there, and for instance we call the likes of the Christian, or we call the disbeliever in this land, they will come with argumentation. Don't think that they're just going to accept what you're saying. You're going to have to debate with them in a good way, in a nice manner. And you're going to have to facilitate them with proofs and evidences. If you are jahil, if you have no knowledge, if you do not have any of this, then how would you expect them to come towards Al-Islam? Simply by way of your action alone? No doubt, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu was the best in action, but yet still he was one who used to call the people with his tongue. The best in action, no doubt. And if the people were to see him, then no doubt they, could, they would enter into Islam by way of his action. But the Messenger of Allah likewise was one who was knowledgeable concerning the religion, most knowledgeable concerning the affairs of Allah. And he would call the people towards that. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِيهِ أَحْسَنٍ And debate with them, or argue with them in a manner which is better, or in a manner which is good. Now the only way a person is going to do this is that he has knowledge of the Qur'an. Many of us, unfortunately, we are weak in regards to our memorization of the Book of Allah. Weak in our memorization of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this shows a deficiency, or this will naturally occur as a deficiency in your court. That you do not know what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala truly has said. Or you do not know what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said. This is a deficiency in our own selves which we recognize in ourselves. No one is going to claim that we are, you know, all hufas and all memorization or memorizers of the Qur'an. But we encourage or we strive to learn as much as we are able to learn in order to call the people towards Al Islam. Furthermore, he said, the Prophet وسلم, he sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu to the people of the book. And he said, O oh, Mu'ad, indeed you are going to the people of the book. So let the first thing that you call them to be, or let the first thing that you, uh, that you call them to be the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is an indication, a clear indication that Mu'ad was a person who possessed knowledge. He was a person who possessed knowledge of the affairs of first the individuals that he was going to. The Messenger of Allah informed him of who he was going to. You're going to the people of the book. So he must have had some knowledge in regards to the affair of the people of the book. Not that we, are need, to be, we need to be people who are, uh, you know, memorizations of the Bible and memorizing the verses and debating with them concerning the Bible because this was not the way of the Salaf. Rather, they were, uh, they were individuals who understood the Qur'an and understood what opposed Tawheed, i.e. shirk, and would understand the shirk in its many different shades and its different forms and aspects, and they would call in accordance with that. So let the first thing that you call them to be the, the oneness of Allah. <clears throat> so if the caller is not armed with sufficient knowledge for him to face every doubt and contend with every opponent, then he will be defeated from the very first encounter. I.e., so he must tool himself up, if you like, for lack of a better term. That he must uh, strengthen himself with knowledge in order to fight off those who are going to debate and those who are going to oppose him. So, secondly, the Shaykh mentions 
acting in accordance with that which he calls to. And this is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, this is important, highly important, that a person, he acts in accordance with that which he is calling to, such that the people will not think about him that he is a hypocrite. And hypocrisy, as we know, is of two types. We have the nifaq of ittiqad or the aqidah by way of belief and the nifaq amali or the hypocrisy by way of one's actions. As for the nifaq or the hypocrisy by way of aqidah, then that is that which takes a person outside the fold of al-Islam. As for the nifaq of action, then this does not take a person outside, of the, fold, outside the fold of Islam. But it is highly important. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, in uh, Surah Al-Saf, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, lima takuluna ma la taf'alun. Oh, you believe. Why is it that you say that which you yourselves do not do? Kabura maktan inda Allahi an takulu ma la taf'alun. Most severe is it in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you say something about that which you yourself do not do. It is important that a person acts in accordance with that which he's calling to. Because if there's anything that a person who you are calling will look at, is your outward action. Is he true to the game, for lack of a better term? Is he truly upon that which he himself claims he is upon? Is he a hypocrite? Is he the type of person that will say one thing and do another? Indeed, acting in accordance with one's knowledge is that which the messengers, all of them, were upon. You would not find the messengers saying one thing and then doing another. Saying one thing here and then betraying what they've said in this place and doing the total opposite in another place. Continue to the prayer, or should we do she and then in the prayer after the prayer? Inshallah. Taib, inshallah, when you begin the prayer. No problem. Taib. So, the Shaykh mentions uh, regarding acting in accordance with one uh, with that which one calls to, acting in accordance with one knowledge and that which he calls to. And as we mentioned, this is highly important. <clears throat> Indeed, the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he made a mention of an individual. That in the hereafter, he will be made to go around the hellfire, dragging his intestines. And he will circle the hellfire as the donkey goes around the, uh, the flour mill, grinding the stones to make the flour. So, so the people in the hellfire, they will see this individual and they will say, Yeah, Fulan, oh so and so, didn't you used to command us to do good and forbid us from evil? So the man, he will return and will respond and he will say, Indeed, I used to command you to do the good, whilst me, myself, I never used to do so. And I used to forbid you from doing the evil, whilst myself, I used to do the evil. This is an individual that will be made to circle around the hellfire, showing the severity of not acting in accordance with that which you yourself uh, are calling to. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, is it that you command the people with righteousness whilst you yourself, whilst you forget yourself? Meaning that you tell 
This one, don't do this, this is haram, akhi. Don't do that, this is haram. Do this, akhi. This is what Allah has commanded you to do. Do this, this is what Allah has uh, said that you must do. This is wajib, this is haram, this, and so on and so forth. Whilst, whilst you turn away from the eyes of mankind, behind closed doors, you're performing the very same actions. Music is haram, akhi. Khamar is haram, akhi. Don't smoke, akhi. So, and then when you go away behind closed doors, you do all these things. كَبُرَ مَكْتًا إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَن تَكُولُ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ Most hated is it in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you say about that which you do not do yourselves. Acting in accordance with one's knowledge. This is important, not just for the eyes of the people, because the true muttaqi, the true one who, uh, the one who fears Allah truly, is the one who fears Allah in open and in secret. Not just in open, not just in, public, in the public eye, in the public domain. You're righteous in front of the people. Whilst behind closed door, you are committing ill sins. And it's better that you commit them in secret. But the point that we're making here is that it's not befitting that a believer commands with the good and forbids the evil whilst they themselves perform those same, very same things. And as uh, many people fall into a trap concerning this from shaitan, shaitan fools many people with this uh, affair. So they say to themselves, Okay, I'm not going to then command good and I'm not going to forbid evil, even though I have the ability to do so, out of fear of falling into the trap of commanding good and not doing it and forbidding the evil and performing it. This is a trick from shaitan. So he wants to get you to not do anything, to become fearful to the extent that you'd perform no actions, no good actions whatsoever. Rather, what you should do is perform those good actions and fear Allah to the best of your ability in regards to staying away from evil. So you have a son, for instance. You know that prayer is wajib, but just because you don't pray, you don't command him to pray. So you fall into the sin of not praying, one, and likewise you fall into another sin of not commanding your child with prayer. This is a trick from shaitan. Even though it is bad, it is evil, that you say about something that you yourself don't do but it would be better in this affair to at least command the good because you have the ability to do so even if yourself don't do it for instance like the prayer but what is the best affair is that you yourself pray and that you command your children with the prayer likewise so the most hated in the sight of Allah is it that you do that which you do not uh, or that you command that which you do not do yourself and as the last one I'll tell mention we'll break for the salah inshallah وَمَنْ أَحْسُنُ كَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And who is there that is better in speech than one who calls to the way of Allah وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And he works righteous deeds. Not that he just calls, not that he just tells the people to do good, not that he just prohibits the evil or forbids the evil upon his tongue, but likewise he himself performs righteous actions. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And he says, Indeed, I am from those who have rendered myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of being a Muslim. نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد. نعم. so to continue, إن شاء الله where we left off concerning the affair of acting in accordance with that which you call to, and this is of utmost importance, of utmost importance, in order for it to be a door. For the acceptance of your call, that those who you are calling will be more ready to accept that which you're calling to, if indeed you yourself are acting in accordance with that which you're calling to. So, first and foremost, knowledge. Secondly, action upon that knowledge, i.e., acting in accordance with that which you're calling to. The third thing that the shaykh mentions is the affair of purity or al-ikhlas. And the affair of ikhlas is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded 
in every aspect of worship, in every affair of worship, then ikhlas is the foundation, sincerity, purity, that, that action must be done solely for the sake of Allah. It is not something which is specific only for da'wah, only for calling to the way of Allah. Rather, the affair of ikhlas is something which is, uh, if you like, which is something which is a condition rather for every single act of worship that it must be sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the scholars have penned and written down numerous times that there are two conditions for the action to receive qubul or receive acceptance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That being, firstly, al-ikhlas. Sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Purity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not done for anyone other than him subhanahu wa ta'ala azza wa jal. And secondly, al-ittiba' or following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is this that we test the people with. Because we find many of the groups of innovation, or many of the people of innovation, when you ask them concerning their innovations that they are performing, the bid'ah that, that, that they are performing, they are saying, they will respond to you by saying that Allah knows my heart. Allah knows my intention, yeah, brother. Allah knows that this is sincerely for him. But indeed, we know that intention and the place of the intention is in, is in the heart. So for a person from outward to recognize whether that intention is pure or whether it is corrupt will be impossible because the place of the intention is in the heart and no one can remove the heart from the individual and look at the intention. No one can do this. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the intention of an individual. So you may see a person with a you know, long, mashallah, flowing beard Tawb and so on and so forth, a sister who's covered from head to toe with the hijab, with the Islamic hijab, but they are doing it for the sake of the eyes of mankind. Rather, purity and the place of the intentions is in the heart. So what we as Salafiyun, as people of the Sunnah who follow the Sunnah, look towards is al itiba is the affair of following. The affair of following. Because no one can question or no one can query the intention of a person because the place of it is in the heart. As for the outer action, is it in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then that is easy to determine. It is easy to determine. So whether a person claims that he's doing something for the sake of Allah, or claims that I'm only doing this for the sake of Allah, whilst it is an innovation, then it is rejected. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, as we know the hadith, مَنْ أَحْتَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا مَا ذَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ whomsoever introduces something new in this affair, meaning the deen of Islam, in this affair of ours, will have it rejected. Or likewise, the hadith of Aisha, man amila amalan, laysa ali amruna fahorad. And whomsoever does an action, whoever does a deed, that is not in accordance with our affair, not in accordance with the religion, not in accordance with the deen of Allah, then likewise it will be rejected. Rejected by Allah, Allah is not in need of that action. Allah is not in need of that action. So sincerity, ya ikhwan, is of utmost importance. Sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such that the call is made purely and sincerely to seek the face of Allah. And not for show, and not for status, and not for leadership, nor desiring worldly goals. For well, subhanallah, this is something which shaitan tricks many of mankind with. And many of mankind fall into, and it is easy to fall into that. MashaAllah, look, the people are looking towards me. They consider me and they deem me to be someone. They consider me to be someone of knowledge or someone of righteous action or someone who, you know, deserves to be referred to. So shaitan comes and he whispers and he whispers up until a person becomes drunk and intoxicated with this whispering. Sincerity, as the Salaf used to say, concerning sincerity, that it is the hardest thing to grasp and the easiest thing to let go of. The hardest thing to grasp, sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Checking that this action that I'm doing is solely for the sake of Allah. Not for the eyes of mankind. Not for status. Not for leadership. Not even for some financial gain. Solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why I'm doing this action. I'm not doing it for any other reason other than this. The hardest thing to grasp, ya ikhwan. Difficult making sure that you know that this action, no, I'm doing it for Allah's sake. No other reason. How many times if you were to stop 
before we do an act of worship, before we give in charity, before we make a smile, before we give sadaqah, before we do such and such and so on and so forth, many are from the actions of worship, from the numerous actions of worship. Do we stop? Do we question ourselves? Do we say, is this solely for Allah? Or is there something by way of shirk, something by way of riyah, something by way of showing off, something by way of sharing the action with other than Allah? It's important. Wallah is important. Because that is the ainul tawheed. That is the that is tawheed in reality. That you single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart first in regards to the action of worship, the outer action of worship. Ikhlas. Since if any of these goals adulterated, the call will not be for Allah. Rather, it would be then be a call for oneself or for the attainment of a worldly goal. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed this prophet, as he said in, in the ayah, لا أسألكم عليه أجرا That I do not ask, say to them, O Muhammad, I do not ask of this, this call that I'm giving you, I do not ask any reward. I'm not seeking by it any reward, i.e. that my calling you to, to, uh, to turn away from kufr and turn, into, and turn towards iman and turn from the darkness into the light and turn from uh, shirk to tawheed, I'm not seeking thereby any reward from any of you. I'm doing this solely for the sake of Allah. لا, لا أسألكم عليه مالا And I don't seek any wealth. How many du'at have become prey to being, or their religion has been bought from them for the sake of money? So then you hear them start to speak with other than that which the Salaf used to speak with. You hear them speak with other than that which the ulama are, are speaking with. For the sake of someone has bought their deen. Here you are, akhi. Faddal, here's a new car. Here's some new clothes. In fact, here's two women, here's two wives. Buying from him is religion. So long you don't speak about our innovation. Don't speak about our innovation, and we will grant you this, and we will grant you that. Did not the Quraysh try this with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Oh Muhammad, if it is leadership you want, then we will give you leadership. If it is women that you want, then we will give you the finest women of the Quraysh. Just stop this call at Tawheed. Stop speaking against our idols. Stop this call that you're calling to, and we'll give you that way, whatever you want. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did he foreplay to this? Of course not. Because his intention and sincerity was for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Likewise, we purify our call and purify ourselves such that uh, our call is not corrupted and that our action is for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. As we know, that from amongst the people who will be called to account on the Day of Judgment will be three individuals, one of them being outwardly a mujahid, a fighter, a warrior in the way of Allah SWT. So it will be said to him, it will be brought on the Day of Judgment, and it will be said to him, show me the blessings that I have granted you. Show me the ni'am, the many bountiful blessings that I have given to you. And he will say, oh Allah, I fought in your way. I fought in your path. And Allah will say, what? Indeed, you have lied. You only fought and showed courageousness and bravery such that the people will say about you that you were brave and that you were courageous. And indeed, it was said. I.e., you got what you want. And indeed, it was said. So then he will be taken by his forelock or by his, fore, by his hair and he will be thrown into the hellfire. Then another individual, a man who used to be a reciter of the Qur'an, and he used to be a person who was given, given knowledge, a person who had knowledge, possessed knowledge of the Qur'an, and possessed knowledge of the book. And it would be said, oh, such and such, show me the many bounties that I have given you. And he would say, oh, Allah, I used to recite the Qur'an, and I used to teach the people for your sake. And it would be said to him, indeed you have lied. You only did so, so that it would be said about you that you were knowledgeable. And indeed it was said, i.e., you got what you wanted. You got what you wanted. You received the reward, the true, the true reward, i.e., the reason why you was doing it, you received it. You received the reward of that. So then it will be said to him, you have lied, and he will be taken and be thrown into the hellfire. And then the third person will be a wealthy individual, a rich person whom Allah blessed with abundance of riches. And the person he used to spend here and he used to spend there. 
And so the, Allah would, would call him and he would say, Oh, so and so, show me the favors, the many ni'am, the bounties that I have given you. And he said, Oh, Allah, I used to spend and give charity in your way, for your sake. And then it would be said, Indeed, you have lied. You only did so so that the people would say about you that you were generous. And indeed, it was said. And then he would be taken and be thrown into the hellfire. Showing about the importance, ya ikhwan, of sincerity in one's actions. That a person know that if you enter a riya or show enough or any form of shirk or sharing that action with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the result of which may be punishment in the hellfire. And just to show how sincerity can benefit the individual is another hadith concerning another free man who embarked upon a journey and they decided to settle down for the night in a cave. It so happened that a rock fell over the opening of the cave. So they turned to each other and they said, let us call upon Allah, let us make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us make supplication to Allah based upon the righteous actions that we have done in the past. So one of them said, oh Allah, Indeed, I used to have parents, and I used to honor and serve my parents. And once I came home, and I found that there was no food in the house. And so I went and milked one of the goats with milk, and I did not feed myself up until my parents awoke from their sleep. I.e. that he sat with the drink, waiting for it with the milk, waiting for his parents to wake, fed them first, and then fed himself. Oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, then remove the rock from the opening of the cave. And then the rock moved slightly. A second man, he said, Oh Allah, indeed, I used to have a cousin or a, family, a female family member who was, if you like, beloved to me, so much so that I wanted to have relationship with her. So, it happened that this, this, this female, she fell upon hard times and was in need of some money. So he said to her, I will give you the money if you give yourself to me. If you give yourself to me. So she agreed. And just upon the point of entry, she said, Oh, son of, of uh, Abdullah, fear Allah, do not break me in this way. So he said that I stopped. And I prevented myself from doing so. Oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, then remove the rock from the opening of the cave. And the rock removed, or moved itself slightly, still not sufficient for them to get out. The third person was an individual who, uh, he had um, cattle that was given to him, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, he had a slave who, Subhanallah. He had I, I, he was the servant or he was the master. And I forget the rest of the ending of the hadith. He was either the servant or he was the master, and he had cattle. And he get and he's and he received, he took one cow or one sheep, and that from it became many sheep and many cattle. The money and it was the wealth he didn't he didn't pay him he didn't pay him Nam Jazakallah Khain. It escaped my mind. The point being anyway, that he said, oh Allah, if, if I did this for your sake, and forgetting the hadith, if anyone recalls it, then you can uh, tell me, inshallah. That if I did this for your sake, then remove the rock from the cave, and he removed the rock. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the rock such that they were able to escape. Showing the uh, great status of, or the position of sincerity. The wages, yes, there was the wages for the work that he did, yeah? You know, Naam. Naam, Jazakallah khair. Okay? But showing the importance of sincerity. That this individual, that these individuals, they supplicate to Allah based upon their sincere actions, their sincere righteous actions. Type. So the shaykh then goes on to mention, fourthly, beginning with that which is of primary importance first, then that which comes after, in, and, and that which comes after it by way of importance and so on. You will find that this is the way of the this is the way of the prophets this is the way of the prophets 
that they were those who used to come to the people and they would say, Oh people, worship Allah. You have no other deity besides him. You have no other God besides Allah. Worship him alone. This was the first thing that they would call the people to. Likewise, as we have, as we have mentioned already in the hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal, the Prophet told him, what? Oh, Mu'ad, you're going to the people of the book? So let the first thing that you call them to be the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَلَقَدْ بَأَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا عَنِ اِبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْسَنِبُ الطَّاقُ And indeed we sent to every single people, a nation, a messenger, saying to them what? عَنِ اِبُدُ اللَّهَ Worship Allah وَجْسَنِبُ الطَّاقُ And stay away from the false gods or the false deities. Important. When we look around and we analyze the cause of many of the people today, do we find that they place the greatest affair first, I at Tawheed, singling out Allah alone first, or is it that they bring something else in its place? If you see a person or a caller, and the most important thing, that, or the, the, the main core of his message was not Tawheed, know that he is upon misguidance. Know that he is upon misguidance, because this was the call of the messengers, all of them. Every single messenger, the first thing that they called to was to remove the people from the affairs of shirk, taking them out of the darkness into the light of a tawheed. Not like we find some of the groups. So they focus upon the khilafah. They focus upon dhikr. They focus upon jihad. They focus upon economic. They focus upon politics and so on and so forth. This is their main focus. That is what they're known for. Our group, our group is for the affair of politics. So what has happened with the tawheed? What has happened to the affair of calling the people to the worship of Allah? If a person dies and never established jihad in the way of Allah, whilst he was not under the rulership of a, of a, of a khalifa or a ruler, and he had no tawheed with him, then where would this individual be? If you go to the kafir, the, the, the non-Muslim, the disbeliever, our port of call, the first place that we begin with them is the affair of Tawheed. The affair of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship Allah alone. Not the affair of economics and the affair of... Not to say, not to say that if a person begins, for instance, a female comes and asks, why do Muslim women have to cover from head to toe? Why do Muslim women have to wear the hijab? Why, why do the men have to grow the beard? Why this, why that? Then we can answer their question, respond to it, but turn in the discussion to the affair of Tawheed. So instead of the affair of the hijab, we turn them to the lord of the hijab. Instead of the affair of uh, the chopping of the hand, we turn them to the affair of the lord who commanded the chopping of the hand and the wisdom behind it. Not just debating upon these secondary issues, and indeed they are from the, the religion and they have importance. But the port of call for every caller is this affair, the affair of Tawheed. <clears throat> So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوهِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَاهٌ 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 أَفْوَانٌ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُودُونَ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and we did not send any of the messengers before you, O Muhammad, except that we revealed to him that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, so therefore make all your worship purely for Allah alone. And this is the affair. That the most important matter is the affair of a tawheed. So then when, when the Prophet وسلم, sent Mu'ad to Ibn Jabal to Yemen, and he said, you're going to the people of the book, and the first thing, let, let the first thing be uh, that you call them to the worship of Allah, then what did he say? And if they accept that, then tell them that Allah has commanded them five prayers in the night and the day. And if they accept that, then tell them that Allah has commanded the zakah. The pain of the zakah. And beware of the, uh, and take from, and take from their, their wealth regarding the zakah, and beware of the dua of the oppressed. For indeed, there is nothing between it and Allah. There is no barrier between the dua of the oppressed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here we see the Prophet ﷺ commanding Mu'ad with giving the uh, call into that which has uppermost importance first, and then that which comes secondary, and then that which comes third, and so on and so forth. Not calling to the, turning the religion upon his head. 
such that and my concern now is the fear of halal meat. My whole dawah is about halal meat. Or my whole dawah is about uh, Muslims, uh, f- uh, I don't know, physicians, or having Muslims in, politi- or in Muslims in the House of Parliament, and so on and so forth. This is my whole concern now. And the fear of Tawheed has been lost. Or it has been placed to the back of the, uh, our, my call. Fifthly, the Shaykh mentioned, to be patient in persevering upon the difficulties and harms that are encountered in calling in the way of Allah. That you should know that when you put yourself out there in the battleground of da'wah, calling to the way of Allah, then know that you're going to face stiff opposition. As the messengers faced opposition, The messengers, they were opposed by their people. Some of them were killed by their people. Some of them were harmed by their people. And the people used to warn against them, some of them, and tell the people not to listen to these individuals, for they are madmen, and they are sorcerers, and they are this and they are that. Harm. You are going to receive harm. Even to, it may may extend to a physical level, that people may wish to attack you because of your belief because of your call. So to be patient upon the call to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith, which is a beautiful hadith, showing uh, the extent of the patience of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when he was sent to Ta'if, and the people of Ta'if, they sent out the youth, the shabab, they sent out the youth to pelt stones at the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So much so that he was covered in blood from his head to his sandals. He was covered in blood. And Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said, If you wish, ya Muhammad, I will cause the two mountains of the valley to crush these individuals. What was the response of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. Do not do so, for I fear or I believe or that I hope that from them comes a people that will recite the Qur'an. Patient upon the harm that came to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whereas us, the slightest, if you like, we're walking down the street, the slightest stare, the slightest wrong look that we receive from the disbeliever or other than them, and we are ready to, you know, be aggressive, fight, want to fight. But here we see the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa being harmed to the extent that blood would drip from his head to his sandals. And yet still he did not seek any revenge, didn't seek any retribution upon these people, rather he had hope for them. Hope that from them would come a people that would recite the Qur'an, i.e. people would embrace Islam. Khabbab ibn Arat. He said, that we complained to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst, we, whilst the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reclining upon his garment in the shade of the Kaaba. Saying, Ya Rasulullah, will you not supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning our condition, meaning that the Quraysh were torturing them and they were harming them and they would pick them off and they would take the likes of Bilal ibn Rabba, take him out into the hot desert sun and torture him by placing rocks upon his stomach. And they would harm the Muslims and kill them. Ya Rasulullah, will you not supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning our affair? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said what? He said, indeed, there were people who came before you and a hole would be dug in the ground for them and a saw would be placed upon their head and they will be cut in two, and that would not make them leave their religion. And that combs of iron combs would be placed upon their skins and dragged across their bodies, such that the flesh would remove from the bone. And, this, and yet this would not cause them to abandon their religion. But I see you individuals, I see you people as a hasty people. Messenger of Allah I'm talking to whom? The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. As a hasty people, 
because they asked from the Messenger of Allah to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he remove this affair from them. Sabr, patience upon the harm that you're going to get. Is it inevitable that the likes of the disbelievers look at you in the way that they look at us when they have seen the likes of what they have seen in regards to 9-11, in regards to 7-7, in regards to this, in regards to that? Is it inevitable? Do you, do you not perceive that these individuals may look at you in that way? Because they may consider you to be from amongst the likes of those who perform those, those atrocities or at the very least support that ideology. At the very least, those who support that ideology, because I cannot say for sure that they did that, but there are individuals we know for a fact who support that type of ideology and agree with that type of behavior. And indeed, the Salaf and the Salafiyun are free from it, and we are free from them. So, it, it's not inconceivable that a person may have some hatred in his heart towards you, thinking that you are of the same ilk or you are of the, of the same type. So that when he sees you, he has a frown. What are you looking at? What? What? You want to speak to him in this manner? Think, ya ikhwan. And this is nothing. This is nothing by way of harm that they stare at you in this way. That they look at the woman with the full hijab and even the niqab and they think. Huh? Think about it. It's not difficult to conceive that they may, to perceive that they may have some problem with you because of the likes of what's taking place. Some of them are, you know, no, no that some of them have kufr in their hearts and they have the hatred for Iman. No problem, okay. But there are some of them who are truly confused in regards to the affair of Islam, confused in regards to the dawah of Islam. What is the call of Islam? Is it like we see in the newspapers? Is it like what we see upon the, the TV? Or is it other than that? And then you go and reinforce the stereotype. Reinforcing the stereotype, yes, these people are an aggressive people. These people are, you know, just want to act for blood and so on and so forth. Indeed, we should be people who have patience. That a person looks at you a way, or a person looks at you a funny way, then you deal with them in a better manner. Deal with them in a better manner. Jadil hum billati, yasan. Call or debate with them or speak to them in a manner which is good, in a manner which is better. So be patient upon the harm that you receive. <clears throat> and likewise, even amongst the Muslims, when a person first embarks upon the Salafi Dawah, from the first enemies and opponents, or those you know, in opposition to him, maybe his family members. What is this that you have taken on board? Why have you abandoned the way that we used to perform Islam? The way that we used to practice Islam? Is that the way that we used to practice Islam no good for you no more? You think you know more than what we know? Your mother, your father, your friends, your family. How will you respond to them? In a, in a bad manner? In a disrespectful manner? Speaking to your mother with disrespect or your father with disrespect? Rather, to be patient upon that harm. Be patient upon that because this was the way of the messengers. The Prophet Nuh, 950 years, ya 950 years calling the very same people to the oneness of Allah. Calling the same people night and day. As he said, Inni da'utum laylan munahara. That very light used to call to them by night and by day. Walam yazidhum du'au illa firara. And my call never did nothing to them except increase them in fleeing away from me. Fleeing away from me. 950 years, imagine. The same people, time and time again, night and day, in open and in secret, individually and as a group. Night and day, 950 years, many of us will become bored. Many of us will become, if you're not bored, sorry, rather become frustrated and leave them and abandon them. Oh, he doesn't want to know about Salafi. He doesn't want to know about Islam. Leave that first. Don't talk to him. He's, he's rubbish. Rather, the way of the Anbiya is that they were patient. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 23 years was the, uh, the length of his call. And as, and as many of the people say, that he, he called for the affair of Tawheed for 13 years. But the reality is that all of the call of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was for, was for Tawheed. 
in Mecca and in Medina. All of it was Tawheed, calling the people night and day, calling them in public and in secret, going to the chiefs, going to the heads and going to the leaders and going to the poor people likewise and the, bel and the belittled people, calling all of them, being patient. And eventually, at the conquest of Mecca, then the people entered into Islam in droves. But prior to that, one person here, two people there, another person there, another person there. This is how it was. Started with a single individual. <clears throat> and many of them plotting to kill Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Plotting to kill him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was patient upon the harm. Praying around the Kaaba and having the intestines of animals placed upon his back. How many, if we were to be praying out in the workplace or we were to be praying out in the street somewhere in the park and someone were to do something like that or even mock at the fact that you're praying, many of us, we know, we know how we'd behave. We know how we'd behave. Our hearts would be inclined towards wanting to do something. But Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, patient, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sixthly, he mentioned, and inshallah we'll try to quickly round up, that the caller must be a person of good manners. Being a person of good manners. Because as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that there is nothing that is more heavier in the scales with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than husnul khuluq. Good character. Good mannerisms. Why we have good character? Why we have good mannerisms? You will find that you will open up the door for the da'wah. Open up the door for the da'wah. Why we have bad characteristics? Why we have evil characteristics? Why we have foul characteristics? This is nothing but a barrier. Nothing but a barrier. As the Prophet wasallam likewise said, he said that uh, there is not any action except that if rift or if uh, rift, softness, nice, softness is placed into it except that it beautifies it. There is not an action except that if softness is placed into it, that it beautifies it. And there is not an action that if shidda or st uh, harshness is placed into it, except that it makes it become ugly and repugnant. So the origin of the affair, the origin of calling to the way, towards the way of Allah, is by way of good character, by way of uh, good characteristics, being nice towards the people. And there was none more nice in his character or more perfect in his character than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned concerning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his character, his sifat or his sifa was that of the Qur'an. That of the Qur'an. So if you were to ponder upon this, for those of us who are people who read the Qur'an, when you read the Qur'an, there are times when you sit and you wish to cry. There are times when it brings a smile to your face. There are times when it makes you want to stand up and pray. The character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was that of the Qur'an. Such that he would speak and the hearts would tremble. That he would speak and the eyes would shed tears. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa would speak and behave and the way that he would behave would cause people to believe, as some of the companions used to say, Ya, Ras ya Rasulullah, when we are with you, we feel like we are in paradise. We feel like we are the people of paradise, rather. And then when we leave and we go home, we feel that we are people who have, you know, turned away from the affairs of paradise. Oh, come on. That when we are with you, we feel like we are the people, like we are people of paradise. Such was the, was the reminder. Such was the way of the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ. Just like the individual who came into the masjid, the Bedouin, and he urinated upon the floor. So though some of the Sahaba, they rushed, they wanted to go in, Strike this individual. So Muhammad Sallallahu said, no, rather, go get water and pour it upon it. So this individual, he said, what? I make supplication for myself and for him, and Muhammad Sallallahu and no one else. He made supplication for himself and for Muhammad Sallallahu and he didn't make it for anyone else. Such was the teaching qualities of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That his characteristic was that of good. So if we want to be upon the call calling to the way of Allah, calling to the, to, calling to the Tawheed of Allah, calling upon the way of the Salaf, 
then indeed it is to be upon the way of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in our in our characteristics. Wallahi, if you were to, inshallah, we were blessed with the Sheikh Sheikh Fala Ismail not too long ago. If you were to see the character of the Sheikh, you could only but fall in love with the way that the Sheikh used to teach, or the way that he taught, and the way that he was with the people, and that he gave himself to the people. I.e., that even though he was ill, and even though he was sick, that he would come and he would teach to 11 o'clock at night, half 11 at night. And this is an individual that was ill. Why? Because the ulama were the anbiya. They are the inheritors of the prophets. Inheritors of that which the prophets came with. And the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no doubt, he came with the good character. Indeed, he said that indeed I was sent, or that I was not sent, except to complete and perfect the good character. I was not sent except for this purpose. Perfecting the good character. And indeed, an individual who has tawheed in his heart, he will have, inshallah, good character. It will emanate upon his limbs. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Shaykh mentioned in the last, and we mentioned the last point, that the caller must remain firm in his expectation and hope for good. I.e., that when a person is calling, that it may not necessarily always be fruitful. His call may not always necessarily be fruitful. He may only find that two people listen to his call, three people, a few people. But he doesn't become frustrated, he doesn't become disheartened with the call, such that he may want to deviate from this clear path or the straight path and go on to somewhere else because it seems more exciting over there. Oh, look at, the, look at that Jamaat there. They have so many numbers. They have so many numbers. So many people are going towards their way. So what I'm going to do now is abandon this clear path and follow them because it's more exciting over there. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لِكُلِّ عَمَلٍ شِرَّةٍ For every action, there is a time of enthusiasm. وَلِكُلِّ شِرَّةٍ فَتْرَةٍ And for every time of enthusiasm, there is a time of inactivity. There is a time of inactivity. So sometimes the da'wah is fantastic. People are coming, da'wah stores, people are entering into Islam in droves and so on and so forth. And then sometimes, quiet, no activity. So, he, so Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, what? So whomsoever's time of inactivity is in accordance with my sunnah, فَكَدِهْ تَدَى That he is upon right guidance. So whosoever time, if, you know when the time when there's not much going on and there's not much enthusiasm, the brothers are not working hard in regards to the da'wah, but he's patient upon the sunnah. Patient upon the sunnah. He doesn't stray. He doesn't go towards innovation because innovation seems appealing now. Lots of numbers, lots of people and so on and so forth. But he sticks to the sunnah, that which he knows from the sunnah, even though there's not much taking place. So whomsoever, his time of inactivity or his time of lack of enthusiasm is upon my sunnah, then he is rightly guided. And whomsoever's time of inactivity or lack of enthusiasm is upon other than that, فَقَدْ halak. Then he is destroyed. Destroyed. Don't leave the straight path simply because there's not much taking place upon the straight path at this particular moment. And there's much going on here, there and everywhere. Look at the numbers. They've got this. They've got a big seminar. They've got, they've got you know, big screens and so on and so forth. And look, they've got this famous individual coming to listen to them. And that famous individual coming to listen to them. Whilst us, what are we doing? We're nothing. We're doing nothing. All we've got is this little maktaba. All we've got is this little masjid. All we've got. But you're patient upon the sunnah. Stick to the sunnah. Don't stray from the sunnah because of inactivity. Rather, he stays firm upon this way and he has a, he has a firm resolve that even if no one responds to his call, that he is fulfilling his duty to Allah in regards to calling to Allah. Indeed, on the Day of Judgment, there will be prophets. Some will come with three individuals. Some will come with two. Some will come with none. Does it mean that these, prof these prophets have failed in their call? Of course not. They fulfilled their obligation to Allah in regards to the call itself. And the rest is in the hands of Allah. 
The rest is in the hands of Allah. You can call and you can call night and day, night and day, and no one responds to you. Look at Nuh alayhi salam. How many families responded to the call? A few. Only a few. Yet still, did this make him become disheartened in regards to the call itself? Of course not. So we keep calling and we have a firm resolve and we have good suspicion in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even if, even if not much takes place, that there is a reward for the call itself. There is a reward for the call itself. And we will not stray from this call for the sake of the masses. Look, all the ikhwah now, they have left us. They've gone over there. They've gone over here. They've gone there. And it's only us left. And it's only us left in the masjid. Or it's only us left in the maktaba. Or it's only us left calling to the way of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Better to be a single individual upon the truth than to be one of the ravel and one of the masses who are upon misguidance. Better. For indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to Ibrahim as an ummah. As an ummah, even though he was a single individual. He was an ummah by himself. Why? Because he was upon that tawheed. Upon the clear way, upon the clear path. So do not become, you know, frustrated, even though there may not be much taking place. Rather stick to the sunnah, and this is the way of the anbiya, and this is the way of our scholars, and this is the way of the salaf, that they will stick to the way of the sunnah irregardless. And so we should find ourselves, or we should be people who try and have these characteristics in ourselves deeply embedded in our hearts and in our limbs such that we don't become confused with the call itself and we don't become confused and we don't become disheartened and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those callers to Islam and we call to Allah in accordance to, with our ability some of us have more ability than others and that we call in accordance with that and that we do not supersede that and wallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala alam uh, Allah knows best Allah alam Inshallah, there's no need for any um, <laughs> questions, just clarifications or uh, corrections, inshallah. <laughs>